colleagues, the Clinical Project Leader of Trauma-Informed Care at the IWK Health Center. She's been researching and implementing trauma-informed best practices within her organization for the past four years. She collaborates regionally, nationally, and internationally with experts and leaders who are championing the integration of trauma-informed practice across all sectors. Holly has many years of experience working in a range of settings with children, youth, and families who have been exposed to and impacted by adverse experiences. She brings a calm and creative energy to her work with a focus on healing and wellness for both service providers and service users. The IWK has, a multiple, has multiple subcommittees working to support the efforts of Trauma-Informed Advisory Committee, and Holly oversees this initiative. So, uh, Ladoo, welcome, Holly. Thank you very much for the lovely introduction. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming and learning more about trauma informed care. And I know in the room there's very expertise already here, so hopefully we can have some conversation throughout the discussion and kind of share some um, experiences that we all have. So, the idea is, is that we're going to take a look at trauma informed care. We're going to be looking at how the IWK implements it, but I know because there's varying degrees kind of understanding of trauma-informed care, we're going to go through some key concepts and hopefully have some discussion, learn from one another, look what the IWK did, but then hopefully talk about how you guys can implement that in your areas to make it a bit more relevant. So that sound okay? Okay, perfect. All right. So some key concepts. When we were rolling this out at the IWK, it was really important that everyone's on the same page. So in our organization, we really looked at everyone becoming trauma-informed. So from our physicians to people in housekeeping, people in the lab, uh, you know, all of our staff, so volunteers. So we really want to take approach, this is an approach for everyone, it's a systematic approach, how do we all do it together? So today we're gonna to be going through some of these key concepts, definitions, focusing on trauma and resiliency, because that's really important, not just focusing on the trauma piece. Uh, looking at the universal precautions approach to trauma-informed care. Uh, we really wanted to make sure that we had alignment with other philosophies that we used, and we'll take a look at what you guys already used too, and we can talk about that. Again, everyone plays a role. Looking at our environments, how do we create those physically safe and emotionally safe environments for trauma-informed environments? Uh, how do we apply to many levels? So we know it applies to you know, the students that we work with, it applies to us, it applies to other systems that we work with, community agencies. So how do we all do this? How do we use this approach? And then the other big point for us to really stress as an organization was that it's not only for the people that we work with, but it's also for us, right? So we all are not immune to having trauma happen in our own lives. And how do we take care of ourselves and each other in that process? And I know you guys had some conversations today about that, so we'll continue that conversation. So consistent definitions. So it was really important for us in rolling this out to have consistent definitions of trauma. So. We really looked at the research, really looking at what do they define as trauma. And a lot of times we kind of, it was more of an event that happened versus, versus experiences. So we really wanted to have that same common knowledge that it's not just an event, it's also experiences that have happened to people and it's how they experience it. So what does individuals say trauma means to them? So it's really, we go with that. So what do you guys hear of when you do your work of some trauma experiences, some students they've experienced? Losing someone. Losing someone, definitely. Yeah, so they're all examples of trauma. And we also think about it too, we want to think of it on those levels and also that it not only affects that student, but also affects their family, also affects the community, it also affects us. So how do we look at it on all those kind of levels as we look at trauma? The other thing we want to look at is generationally. So we may have students in our environments that may have not experienced trauma themselves directly, but their parents may have, or their grandparents may have, and what effect that has on them. So really having that common understanding for all of us to say, you know, it can apply to many different, you know, people, many different generations, in many different ways. So we're gonna take a look at resiliency. So that's the other balancing factor. So we know people can experience trauma, but we also know that people are very resilient. And I think a great example that um, we actually shared and the school has been sharing with us is the Syrian newcomers that are coming to our country, right? And we know some of these children have experienced very, you know, horrific events in their lives, very, you know, negative events, but they're very resilient, they're very <coughs> adapting to their new environment, able to cope. So really thinking about it in that way too, so they're able to overcome that adversity. Um, so really keeping in mind too for them and other people that we work with that experience trauma, unless they experience it as trauma, it's not trauma for them. So you and I may experience the same event, I may say it's traumatic, you may say it's not. So it's really figuring out from that person that you know you may have experienced a negative life event, but do you experience it as traumatic, do you? So asking those questions. 
So prevalence and effects, the other thing that we really want to make sure on organizational levels, on our system levels, that people really understand the prevalence of trauma because it is really huge. So have you guys heard of adver adverse childhood event study that was done before? Hold on, okay. So it's a really good study to look into. So it was done with the Center for Disease Control and Kaiser Permanente in the United States. So what they did is they asked people that were working class people coming in for health insurance interviews and they asked them, have you experienced any of these adverse events as a child? So again, these are people that have jobs, have health insurance, right? So they have a lot of supports, a lot of income, those kind of situations. And what they found out was quite remarkable. So they asked them about, did they experience physical, emotional, sexual abuse? Did they experience violence in the home? Did they have someone in the home that had a mental illness, used substances, was incarcerated? Um, or they experienced divorce to the extent of when the parents divorced, they didn't see one of their parents after that point. So this is what they found out. They found out 67% of people experienced at least one of those as a child. And as you can see, the numbers kind of get a bit more. Um, one in four were exposed to two categories of trauma. One in 16 were exposed to four. 22% um, were sexually abused as children. 66% of the women in the group that they interviewed said they experienced violence or family strife as a child. And 50% of women more likely than men to experience five or more of those categories. So that's pretty huge. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then when we look at within the areas that I work in with is with children and adolescents uh, with the mental health and addictions, they found out that 66% of people in substance uh, treatment facilities have experienced reported child abuse or neglect, and 80% of children and adolescents that have had a suicide attempt attributed to these childhood adverse events. So it is really huge. Um, what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, so they found the more ACEs that you had, the more likely you were to have we may think of, you know, you may be more likely to have depression or anxiety, but they also think that you're more likely to have cancer, you're more likely to have heart disease, you're more likely to have a stroke, you're more likely to have diabetes. So all these physical health illnesses as adults that we don't always correlate, right, to the child adverse experiences. So what impact does ACEs have on children? And what do we see as we work with children? Well, we see a lot of problems with attention. We see a lot of problems with concentration. We see a lot of children that come to us that may experience or may look like they have attention deficit disorder, but actually have trauma. Um, we may see them not being able to trust others because um, they haven't been able to establish those kind of attachments with their caregivers early on. And then it's really hard for them to have those bonds with us. Um, we may also see them as kind of angry and aggressive. And the other thing that um, Somebody mentioned one of uh, the teachers actually in a presentation that we did last week is that she said we tend to recognize those children that do appear aggressive, but we tend not to recognize the children that are very quiet and don't, you know, have those moments or don't kind disrupt of are really the class. isolated. They don't disrupt the class. Exactly, they don't disrupt the class or they don't disrupt the environment, and we don't tend to pay attention to them as much. But they still experience trauma, but they just um, kind of show us in a different. Right? So just kind of keeping that in mind too is not always, you know, um, the children that can may experience angry outbursts or those kind of things. And then the other thing that we see with children is that they may, or adolescents even more, is that they may end up kind of experiencing or experimenting with drugs or alcohol. They may start to self-harm. They may start to have suicidal ideation. So when we look at trauma with children, it can impact them in many different ways, and it's really in many different areas. So it's that physical, emotional, spiritual, all aspects of their lives. And this is what the next slide really gets into. And a lot of children will say, you know, I have guilt about what happened, I don't feel, I don't feel myself, I don't feel that I'm worthy of these things. So just as we go, knowing that each child can experience or youth can experience this differently, but just kind of keeping our eyes open to that it may be not initially what we think to the universal precautions. So we talked about the stats about trauma. So when we look at kind of even more than the ACEs study, there's lots of studies out there that they say anywhere between 50 and 90% of people have experienced trauma. And when we look at Canadian statistics, there's actually studies from McMaster University that say, uh, they actually called up people, used census data and cold called people and said, have you experienced trauma? And people answered, which was good for the data for us to have it. So with 76% of people in uh, Canada said they experienced at least uh, one traumatic event. When we get into mental health and addictions kind of areas or studies that anywhere from 90% to 96% of the people have experienced, so it's, it's high, right? 
Um, so what do we do with that? So we know it's very prevalent, okay, we know many of, uh, you know, our students, our clients, people that we work with, families may have experienced trauma, so what do we do with that? And what we're looking at is really almost using a universal precautions approach to say, you know, so many people have experienced trauma, so how do we create those environments that are safe, that are trustworthy, um, doing it in a systematic way that creates an environment that is safe for people that have experienced trauma? That gets into the trauma informed care definition. So it is that strength-based universal precautions approach that we're looking at, uh, recognizing that trauma is really prevalent and how do we look at it in that way that it also acknowledges that it's not just you know the students or families that we work with or clients, but it's also each other, right? And how do we work with that? So when we look at principles of trauma informed care, um, there's generally five principles that we will look at. And this is really what the basis of this is, and thinking about the environments that you work on and how do you create these environments. So looking at safety. So how do you maximize the physical safety in our environment? So when you walk into an area, a school, kind of a meeting space, what does it look like? Do people feel comfortable coming in? Are they welcomed in there? Um, and then again, it can be the most beautiful new space, but people are kind of arguing in the background and not getting along. Um, and people aren't gonna really feel that welcome to come in. So we need to be thinking about those pieces. Privilege. Just to the side, we have a, yes. the privilege of creating a parent family room. Yes. It should be, a, I, I would think, you must be right about that, that everybody has a space designated for schools bus. Yes. And hopefully a budget that they can furnish it and, and be mindful of these kinds of things. Exactly, yeah, because I've seen some actually of the school plus areas, and I must say, the ones I've seen are beautiful and are great and are very well thought out about being welcoming when you walk in, you feel like, oh, like, I want to come here and you know people are very friendly very welcoming so you guys definitely do a great job with that um, but really again I, and then thinking about what else is there anything else we can add right to that and trustworthiness so a lot of times with people that experience trauma it has been with someone that they trusted most times maybe with children so how do we create those trustworthy environments and a lot of times it is kind of through that structure structure and boundaries knowing what is expected of me knowing in that situation that okay you know, if I do this, this happens, if I do this, or what's the parameters of, you know, the relationship for when I'm with someone. So really knowing those appropriate boundaries. And choice. Do we provide choice to the extent that we can? So working with students, you know, a five-year-old's choice is definitely going to look different than a 15-year-old's choice, but how, what kind of options can we provide for people? Because a lot of time their choice has been taken away. Um, and collaboration. How do we maximize collaboration? How do we work with them to really work on what they want to work on? Because sometimes I know when I've kind of fall into this too, I'm thinking, oh, I have this great goal and I know they can do it, and and then, but it's not kind of where they want to work from. And they may eventually want to go there and get there, but how do I kind of meet them where they are, right, to kind of work with them to do that. And empowerment, really prioritizing um, their empowerment skill building. So a lot of times children or adolescents will say, you know, we're really focusing on this traumatic event that happened, but I'm really good at basketball, I'm really good at making friends, I really, and great this out of the other thing. So how do we focus on the things that they're great at and really build that self-esteem and capacity that way? Um, there's some really great stories that your colleague shared within the school system, um, what I think was in Annapolis Royal, where they had a student who was in the school system there, was often going to the principal's office, getting in trouble, um, and then they recognized that he was really good at fixing things. And one day, I think it was the vice principal said to them, you know, do you want to help me fix this? And they're like, yeah, sure. So they started to help fix the maintenance person. They started to help fix things. And they got to the point where one time they were kind of unscrewing things to find things for the person to help to fix, right? <laughs> so they were like, okay, well, and that was an in for them. So that was an in to kind of build that relationship and say, okay, we share this common thing. You know, this is really strength of yours. How do we build on that? How do we, you know, get you into some kind of, you know, after school experience to kind of build on that skill? Um, another one was, um, a staff member, their chain fell off their bike, and a youth was there and said, oh, I can help you fix that, right? And they fixed that, and then they started fixing, like, bikes in the school or started doing things. So just really looking, but they said that would be in. Like, before that, there was no communication, there was no relationship, there was no kind of conversation about it. It was just, okay, but when that moment happened, then it opened the door to really say, you know, we believe in you, we think you can do great things, you know, how do we help you to get there? And that was really a positive thing for them. The other big thing about trauma-informed care that we're really looking at, at organizations is that how do we not only focus on our students, our patients, families, how do we look at our staff because 
if we're not well, then they're not going to do, we're not going to be able to do our job to the best extent that we want to do it. Not only that, we're not going to be able to go home and have our own work-life balance and be with our own families and have the energy to do that and do our own hobbies and activities, right? So we really need to be thinking about how do we support everyone in this environment. Vicarious so, trauma. Vicarious trauma. Yeah, vicarious trauma, burnout, compassion, fatigue. Yeah. So we're going to be talking about those, and I mean, I can start to talk about them now. But really, there's, you know, lots of times that we will, kind of in our career, may experience burnout, right? Because the system, you know, I can't change the system. I feel like I'm bringing forward, um, you know, different ideas, and I just can't get them in. And like, what's the use? You know what I mean? You're just kind of at your moment. Um, and then vicarious trauma is really, you know the change of our worldview. So we hear all these stories from the people that we work with and how that has an effect on us at the end of the day, right? So how do we as organizations really acknowledge that that can happen, right? And that happens and we don't talk about that enough to know that that does happen, but how can we intervene earlier? How can we prevent that from happening? So looking at it from different angles of, you know, personally, you know, an organization can say, oh, Holly needs to go out and uh, there's an article actually, it's called Kale and Pedicures. So go out, meet your kale, do your pedicures, and you're going to be great, right? But uh, maybe for a little bit, and I need to take accountability for that. But it's not just me that has to do it. It's also our organizations. What do they provide for us? How do they support us to do those things, right? So, and that's a systems change, right? So we really need to be thinking about it on leadership levels, on our levels, to figure out how do we make that happen. Because sometimes it's not easy in big systems to do that. Yeah. I just, I, I don't want to take away no, no. But I'm just thinking of an example where I've had a tough time in a school because there's a grade one student that's wreaking havoc on the school. And the school administration and the teachers are very much focused on a mental health needs to be in the school, and that's the problem, and this isn't going to get fixed until this kid sees mental health. The parent wants to do with mental health. And so we're stuck okay. there. Yeah. They can't, there's no solution focused stuff going on, there's no holistic approach because the zero focus is getting yeah. mental health connected with that kid, yeah. and it's not helpful. So, well, that's, that's the thing, we need to think about what we can do, right? And sometimes, again, the expectations that we have, I know, um, you know, some people in the schools are saying, you know, we want them to reach this outcome or reach this goal, and really the only thing that's going to happen, maybe, is that they can go in the classroom mm -hmm. and actually get in there, right? Or actually go to four classes or one class or whatever. So, again, it's our expectations and what can we do? And what is everyone's goals? And are we on the same page? Because obviously the parents on a different page than the youth is, and than we are, right? So how do we kind of say, you know, this is what we're thinking, but <coughs> being, I think a big part about this is really being transparent and honest, saying, you know, this is what we think can help, and this is why we think it can help. Like, what, is there any barriers or anything that I need to help you with? Maybe the parent has their own mental health concerns that they don't want to deal with. You know what I mean? It's, it's always very trauma, <laughs> exactly. It's very multi-leveled, right? Yeah. And it's not, again, it's not just that one person that we're dealing with, it's a family community. It's all those pieces together, and how do we, even make it safe enough for them to have a conversation of why maybe they don't want their child to be in mental health services or what do they think that means or you know what do they think they do need right and just it's, it's not easy those conversations for sure and it's not always a quick fix either because they may not feel safe even telling us they may think I told somebody five different people what I need before and nothing happened so I'm not going to tell you because I think you're just going to do the same thing right so it's almost it's really about relationship building and how do we build these relationships how do people know that they can get on us or when I say I'm going to do something, I do it. And if I can't do it, I often tell them that because there's going to be times we can't do it, right? Mm -hmm. So just being honest and authentic about that and saying, you know, like I want to help you, I want to do that, but right now I can't. And with here's the reason why. And then again, just building that relationship. That part I don't find hard. I don't yeah. find hard when parents are communicating yes. where they're at. Yeah. The hard part I find is when they don't. the school system. Yeah, like, yeah, it's like enforcing change when you know change is going to take a long time. It is, and it is going to take a long time. It's, it's a, I mean, all this work even is a culture shift, right? It's a shift in the way people think and how we approach things. So yeah, it'll take, take a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. But I think every, not every little person fits in the box. No. no. And they don't. And we see that when it doesn't work, right? Yeah. So we try, we try on it. It's fine to try on things that generally work, but when we find out it doesn't, then we know something else is happening here, right? We have to kind of look at it in a different way. Yeah. It might work for not if you're presenting this kind of information to the education, you know, in their workshops and PD days, yes. the educators are kind of, like you said, sort of the same climate. Well, that's the thing. That's the idea of all of us being on the same page, so not only 
you know, the health system where I come from, but we're doing these kind of presentations in education, in Department of Community Services, in Justice, in like all these That's departments, true. right? Because we all need to be on the same page and all that leadership levels and frontline levels and all the levels in between, right? So we all need to be coming from the same place in order to make this happen, right? So those conversations are, are happening for sure. Yeah, are starting to, but it does take time. Yeah, lots of levels of work-related stress, and I mentioned it's not only how do we look at it on the organizational, professional, personal level, and what do we do about it. Um, we just talked about the burnout, compassion, fatigue, and vicarious trauma, and it definitely, definitely happens, and we need to respond. So, again, how am I responding? How am I helping myself? How's the organization helping? Me? What are we doing collectively together? Because me just doing my thing is not going to work, and them just doing their thing is not going to work if I don't take off on it either, right? So, how do we really look at this in a holistic way? And um, so at the IWK, we have lots of structure in place because this is a culture shift and we want to make this really work. Um, so we really took time for all of us to be on the same page with a vision and mission, really looking at a culture that understands trauma and actively creates safe physical and psychological places that improve everyone's spaces or that improve everyone's experiences. So again, it's about everybody. It's not just about one person, one population, one group. It's everybody. And our mission is to embed safety and trustworthiness into everyday interactions, policies, and practices. To acknowledge and understand the effects of trauma on people. So the policies and practices piece is really where the rubber is thrown, right? Because it's great to say, okay, we have this philosophy, we're doing it, but how do you embed it in the policies? How do you embed it in the practices? And that's pieces that we're working on that we'll, we'll get into as we go. Because it is, it has to be almost in your everyday, kind of your thinking and how you approach things. Um, so we do have a lot of different groups in our organization that are looking at this. So this is like 150 people in these groups. So this is IWK members, so patients and families, staff. This is all those departments that I mentioned. So there's people from HRSB on that. There's people from Department of Education. Um, there's people from Justice on there, community groups, volunteers, lots of different people. So we're looking at different things such as education, what education does everybody need in our organization. We're looking at psychological wellness and health of staff, so that's one group on its own. We're looking at physical environments and emotional environments in our organization. Um, and then we're looking at early response and screening, and then assessment and treatment. So for us, it's how do we create that environment with everybody, and then also moving into the more specific treatment pieces too that we do. Um, and then it takes as you can see, a lot of different people and a lot of different groups to kind of make that happen. And then we're also trying to go through, make sure we're evaluating it, we're using the latest research, best practices, um, that we have, you know, we have some support to do that too, that's great. Partnership, totally essential, because without all these partners, nothing, nothing would take place. So it's really great though, it's great to have a lot of like-minded people in the room that are really like, how do this work? We really believe in this, so it's been really, um, great experience I think for all of us and the big piece too is not um, reinventing the wheel in a sense so if the IWK is working on something how do we get people in collectively to work on it together if Department of Human Services is working on something how do we also um, work together or not be doing the same pieces of work how do we do it together or how do we share the work so it's been a lot of sharing so we have some posters over on the table there and some tools that we developed within the IWK Nova Scotia Health Authority and um, and then some tools and checklists that are over there, and we want to share those, so please take those um, at the end of the session and feel free to use them and share them, because that's the thing, I mean, we have the resources and the time to do some of this work, so we want to make sure that everyone can benefit from it and use it. Um, and learning from others, that was a big lesson, so really looking at who are the experts already out there within trauma-informed care, how do we get in contact with those people, how do we utilize their expertise, because again, we don't want to start, they already did a lot of work out there in the world, so how do we kind of tap into that? Um, so we worked a lot with uh, Community Connections, which is an organization in the United States that really developed the principles of trauma-informed care, really working with them with their assessments and how they determine how organizations are trauma-informed, um, working with the Trauma Center in Boston for some of our treatment stuff for the attachment regulation and competency training you guys might have heard of and might have taken. Um, and experts again such as Nancy Poole in BC that we worked with on a provincial level and also on a national level to look at trauma-informed care. Um, I'll get into some of this in a minute. So this is our environmental checklist and it is over on the table. Um, so we were really looking at in starting trauma-informed care in our organization is how, what tools do we have, what can we use to really get people on board and even 
kind of foundational sense of what does it mean to be trauma informed. So we developed this checklist with input from all those people. Yeah, there's some there on the table. If you want to grab some. Um, and it really looks at a lot of different areas. So it takes the principles of trauma informed care and kind of breaks it down. It also looks at kind of cultural safety, individual safety, staff pieces. Um, and for our teams, we're really looking at that checklist and saying, you know, are we doing this? Um, is this working? You know, are we creating those? Are we having debriefings within our teams? Are we having team meetings? Do we have opportunity for communication? Do we have patient kind of feedback come to us? Do we have physical spaces that are welcoming, developmentally appropriate? So all those many different things. And then our teams are going to take their top three priorities and work on them for the year. So that's kind of the idea and the organization of how to get everyone um, kind of on board to do that. So yeah, really looking at your physical spaces, as I mentioned, kind of walking into spaces, are they welcoming, are they friendly? Um, a big thing for us was in our policies and information packages, we had a lot of information that said, you know, if you come here, you can't smoke, you can't curse, you can't do this, you can't do that, and then like people were coming back and saying, well, what can we do? Like, can we rephrase this? <laughs> like, really though, right? So is that really welcoming? Does that make people want to come to our service? Probably not. So we're really looking at our wording now and saying, okay, well, what does it look like when you come here? What can you do? Like, how does this, this work? And again, it's not that we don't have kind of boundaries set in there, what the expectation is, but how are we kind of wording it in a bit of a different way? Um, do we have, yeah, culturally appropriate symbols of safety? So um, a lot of our clients and families would say, you know, I don't see myself in the organization. I don't see myself either in the staff or in the artwork or whatever it is within the building. So how do we look at that and change that? Um, and then be looking at the emotional environment. So a lot of pieces, making sure, you know, again, that we're being transparent, we're seeking feedback all the time. Uh, we're making sure that we're really asking, you know, what are triggers, and we'll get into that in a moment, which I think is a huge, huge piece of it that's really important. And then also recognizing with one another, you guys will work with your teams and you'll get to know each other really well. So you're going to know, you know, um, Persona, my colleague that's here, if he's kind of off today, I'm going to say, okay, Persona, like, are you okay? Do you need any help today? Do you need a break? What do you need? Because some days we're going to have those days and we're human, right? So we need to be able to feel comfortable enough to say to one another, you know, today's my off day. You know, can you just give me five minutes, ten minutes, whatever it is, and help me out, and hopefully you can do that for one another. The other big thing in our organization that we looked at was the language, and there are some of the posters over there that are kind of broken down from this one. Um, so a lot of language in the past is kind of used, and not really made to be kind of in a bad way, but it definitely gives that impression. So people may say, we had a client in Emerge, and they're, you know, starting to yell, or starting to get aggressive, and they're like, oh, they're just attention seeking, right? And it's like, okay, well, maybe they're not attention seeking, maybe that's how they got their needs met, right? So if we think back to kind of children and back to kind of attachment to younger children that have caregivers that when they say, if they can't speak, you know, mom, I need help, and they don't get help, and they're screaming, mom, I need help, and nobody comes. Then they start kicking, mom, I need help, nobody comes. They start punching the table, mom, I need help, and then they start punching somebody, and then somebody does something, right? And then they come to us, and they think, oh, I have to do that, I have to be aggressive for you to listen to what I have to say, and then they realize, no, I don't, because we model that we don't have to have that happen. That actually when, you know, they say, okay, I need help, we do listen to them when we do come. So it's, we play a huge role in the lives of these students, for sure, because it's really, we may be the first people that they kind of establish appropriate attachment to, an appropriate relationship that really responds in a way that's healthy for them, that they see in its models, and that they can also carry that into the rest of their lives, right? So it is, you guys play a huge part. Um, the other thing that we did in our organization and which other organizations are doing too is looking at pre kind of official trauma informed care, where are we at? So last February before we did a launch of education, we did a readiness survey and we asked people, you know, are you introducing yourself? Are you thinking about trauma when you meet with, you know, patients, families, clients, students, whatever your case is? Um, and we had a lot of interesting results because a lot of people said, no, we're not doing that all the time. So it was good that they were honest about it, but really then they start to reflect on really the importance of all those things that are really basic but are really huge. Um, so we're actually running that readiness survey next month, um, and we'll see kind of how we did kind of a year after launch. Let's just look in the IWK. It is, yeah. Yeah, and we do the readiness survey, so any, like if a, you know, organization school wanted to use it, you can definitely get it from me and kind of adapt it to use it. Because it really does give you a baseline before you start really 
giving an overall organizational education kind of plan and system of where you're at, and then you can kind of measure where you're going. And that's actually adapted from um, community connections that I mentioned, so that group in the United States, uh, a homelessness survey, and another survey that we kind of compile their, <coughs> their information. <coughs> Um, so education plan. So in our organization, everyone gets level one education. So really what trauma is, the effects of prevalence, what's trauma-informed care, how does it apply to my role. We do exercises with the principals and say, um, principals of trauma-informed care, I should say, that look at safety, trustworthiness. So how am I doing that in my job? So how am I doing that as you know, a social worker? How am I doing that as an outreach worker? How am I doing that as somebody, um, as a volunteer at a desk? So really we look at everyone and how they're doing that in the organization. I think that's been a really um, big piece of buy-in for us because people see themselves in it. It's not something that you do or you do, it's something that I can also do and I have some control over myself to do. Um, so I know within you know, the school systems, they, they've even been talking about, you know, should we have basic trauma-informed education for our cafeteria staff, for our bus drivers, for our, those people? We've actually did it with some schools that had those people there, uh, which I think is huge. Yeah. Level two education. Um, is for our staff that work in mental health and addictions, and it's ARC training, so attachment regulation and competency training. We just did that in November, January uh, past, so we're just starting to roll that out, um, and we'll get into a little bit about that, but that's been a really great, uh, a great approach for us to kind of have all that common language, same language within our system. And then level three is for trauma treatment, so our clinicians that are providing trauma treatment, what trauma treatment are we providing, what education support do they need supervision to do that. Well, we actually, when we rolled out ARC, we did invite uh, people from, you know, schools, we invited people from DCS um, or community groups, so we did put out open ask uh, for people to come at the time, so it was kind of open to any community partners that we had, yeah. So we had about 300 people, yeah. yeah at that hotel last year, there was like a thousand of us, wasn't there? Oh, and uh, yeah, so at our launch training, yeah, that was our level one education training, yeah, there was, there was, we had, I think, I think at the end of it, 1,100, I think, people. Yeah. Like over four days that we, we drained, yeah. It was, it was good. <laughs> um, and this is the ARC framework, if you guys are interested. And I know they are looking at it kind of for the schools and school environments. Um, communication plan. So we were fortunate enough to have some money to kind of brand kind of trauma-informed care and uh, your experiences matter was um, the kind of phrase that we come up with with consultation from uh, different groups and it really applies to anyone right so it's whoever you are whatever experiences you bring they matter so it could be as a student your family patient staff whatever the case is um, we also launched a website so there is a lot of great resources I do some at the end of the presentation uh, but this is our website we do a resource section that you can go through different resources that are and if you find any resources that you think are really good within your system, let me know and we can upload them. Um, and then just communication, newsletters, posters, <coughs> those kind of things. Um, the other big thing is that we were looking at what alignment with other approaches so people would kind of have kind of an uptake on it too and an understanding. So for us, it was patient and family centered care, um, really looking at the alignment with that approach. And I know in the school system, they're really looking at restorative approaches, so that definitely is in alignment with that, right? So <coughs> really looking at what other approaches you guys have currently and how does it fit and what does it look like. So that way people don't think it's kind of reinventing the wheel, but it's how do you complement all these approaches and what does each of them bring. Um, so integration to daily practice. So what can I do to be trauma informed? I mean, everyone can kind of look at creating those safe spaces, working in partnership, having respectful conversations, uh, really looking at empowerment and engagement. Um, there was a really great example that we had actually in our art training about uh, a student um, that was in a school in Boston and his brother was actually getting involved and they kind of anticipated that the younger brother was getting kind of pulled into that world. Um, and the principal actually of that school had a choice. They could take the top, I think it was male and female student, and then won the principal's choice. So they made a decision to actually pick that boy who was starting to get gang involved to go to this leadership conference. Because they said, okay, we see you in the school, you command power, control, people listen to you. So if you actually turn those skills in a positive way, what would that look like? 
right? Yes, exactly. So, right. So, and that really struck me because it is true. That takes it takes skill to be in that world <laughs> environment, right? So, how do we transfer those skills and put it in a positive way? So, um, this was actually another great example of how it ended up changing someone's course, right? So, he was like, okay, I have this skill. Now I'm seeing how it's applied in a positive way again around people that are you know, get positively influencing me and how does that affect me and now I can see maybe a different way of life than I did before, right? So how do we take advantage of those opportunities? Um, within our health center, we try to find out ways that it applies in, every, applies in every area. We'll get into more of the school area pieces, but in our area, so for example, Children's Health, we're really looking at how people may commit with trauma, but they also may experience in their health center with the medical interventions they may undergo, right? So not only do they commit with trauma, but we could be causing trauma, so how do we try to prevent that? And even in lab areas, you know, when you have a child who's coming in for lab work and they're not, not too happy about it, how do we make that less traumatizing from them, for them? Um, looking at our Women's Newborn Health Group, looking at, you know, even, um, I know even myself, when I go into the doctor's office, it's even having somebody say, does anyone say to you, oh, is it okay, you know, if I touch you, I need to do this exam, I need to do whatever, we don't get that a lot of the times, right? So we have people actually asking, touch us before they touch us and asking for permission, so that's a big one. Um, are we asking, you know, or are we comfortable if somebody discloses trauma? So I know overall in our health center at the IWK, there are a lot of staff that came forward and said, you know, I don't know what to say if somebody discloses trauma to me. I don't know how to support that, and I don't know, you know, the right thing to say, and really helping, you now a big piece of our work is how do we coach people to even have those conversations, right? What do I say? How do I support people? How do I feel comfortable? What resources are there? That was the other thing, like, it's great for them to say, and then I don't know where to even tell them to go, right? So really looking at, kind of, for us, a system of, like, okay, yes, now you know what to say, but also you can tell them here's where you can get some help. So really making sure we had a systematic kind of approach to that was really important. And again, really for our non-clinical staff, really recognize that the volunteers at the volunteer desk are the first people that most people see when they come to the IPK. And they help them navigate the lovely building that they can't get through, and you know, even let them know where to go and take them there, and it makes a big difference. So what does it look like in the school setting? Lots of different things to support children with trauma and within your work. Um, a lot of it is really looking at Kind of attachment, looking at regulation, looking at their competencies, uh, looking at their triggers. Um, and I'm going to go through a few of these and uh, you guys I'll send um, kind of the PowerPoints you guys will have it and have more of an in-depth of all these, but I'm just going to pick a few of them to go over more in depth for this time. Um, so yeah, attachment is huge. So we think of the attachment relationship in relation to care providers, but really we also want to look at it Again, they may not have had that attachment relationship, and we may be the first people that they actually have a healthy attachment relationship with. So how, what does that look like, and how do we do that? And I just want to play this quick video. Um, there's some, overall, it's a great video. There are a couple things that we may say a little bit differently, but I think it gives a good overall message of it. still pointing a storm. I really don't want you missing my classes, Bobby. You're a good student. Should leave that. I wasn't born a vandal, but I smashed up the clutch. Bam! I 
wasn't born a show off, but I needed to get attention. Toby, okay, that's not helping. What would help is attachment. And initially the child needs a carer in the school to function a bit like a soothing parent and in a way function like the frontal lobe of the child. We're feeling scared. Trying to run away from what you've done. But you can't. Come on, Martin. You need to tell us the truth about what happened. Then we can get this sorted. I was lucky. At school. At college. In the infants, I had a teacher. A teacher. A teacher. Who listened. Who understood. Who made a difference. So do you see any of those? I will be sharing that. That's a powerful one, right? They need to hear that. Again and again. Yes. Yeah. They'll be happy to. It's in the presentation, but I'm happy to send you the link because it's true. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is. If you look up attachment aware in schools, it'll, yeah. it'll pop up. Because it is. We need to be thinking of those things, right? And sometimes it does have to pull at the heart sometimes in order to get us there, right? Yeah, people are so busy. You might have a conversation with them, but if it's something in email or something they can go back to or save it in a, I don't know. When I shout to someone, it's not because. phrase that each of them said that I was not born and because I was not born. That is so powerful because it takes us as a reminder. This is a child, no matter what age, exactly. three, seventeen. This is a human being, a child, yeah. not the behavior. Exactly. And that's what I have to go back to. What is the meaning behind the behavior? Right? They've had to adapt that way and that's why they're they're coming in this way, right? It's what worked. So we really need that's that's a big culture shift. If there's anything any of us can take away, it's that, right? I remind teachers that, you know, the child doesn't wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to be an asshole today. Mm -hmm. No. The child doesn't do Definitely that. Definitely not. No. No. They might end up being an asshole, <laughs> but there's a reason behind it. Yeah. 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 But they don't wake up saying they want to be that way, and a lot of teachers just think that that's how it is. I think teachers are tapped out, too, because, the, again, I hear from teachers, oh, I'm a teacher, I'm not a mental health clinician, and they don't feel equipped to deal with now that's the thing, we need to support one another, right? And do we yeah. have the right skills, the right resources to do that? And sometimes, sometimes we don't, and sometimes we need help, and are we okay to say that because it's not a reflection, you know, me and my role that I need help, you know what I mean? So it's really, I think, that culture of saying it's okay to say I need help, yeah. right? And how do we support that? There are many layers of the NSTU issue, and certainly, you know, the work to rule unfortunately sort of fit the model for some. They were quite comfortable with administration and teachers working to rule. Others were just hampered because they're so passionate and they're available and they have wonderful, rich classrooms and meaningful relationships with the most trouble. Yes. You know, we get those because we generally jump over the page as a referral. But, you know, how do you help them share and model to other teachers that yes. aren't equipped? Yeah. They just, for expedience sake, it's the acting out is disruptive. Yeah. And they're just not emotionally available to them, you know? And you know, maybe and part of that argument is how many programs are they doing Friends for Life for children have understand, have a better understanding of empathy uh, so they can get to numeracy and literacy. They can turn to the math book, you know, versus just trying to regulate the class. Exactly. And I think, you know, they may be walking wounded and vicariously, you know, oh, for burnt sure. out for and sure. you know, so there's a whole lot right? right? yeah. The environment doesn't take care of its teaching staff in terms of wellness, you know, yeah. then we come in as a sort of support and try yeah. to share that burden, and, yeah. uh, but sometimes we're not to take it all off. Well, that's the thing, no one person. That's how we have to... the magic wand. <laughs> I'd love to have the magic wand. Fix yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little great one, boy. Save that magic wand. Yeah. So one of the things that I would say, and I'm sure you guys already do this, but I think one thing that we may not do a great job, and I know even my own environments, is that looking at triggers. We know that these kids have triggers. We really need to be making plans on what are those triggers. Sometimes the kids aren't even going to know what the triggers are, right? They're not going to know. 
And how do we help them know? Do we know like certain time of year? Do we know the substitutes come in and then you know that they're kind of off guard because it's somebody new. They don't know them. They don't trust them. They're gonna you know it's gonna be a time that they're not able to regulate themselves, right? Or they don't somebody to help them regulate in that situation. Um, I know there was a story about a child who every year on Valentine's Day um, would start to disrupt the classroom and they're like, what was it with Valentine's Day? And it was younger kids, they're like, so it's not like about a relationship or anything. And what they found out is that the kid was removed from their home on Valentine's Day. Right? So until they found out that, right, you'd be just like thinking, what is going on here? What is it about Valentine's Day? But it wasn't until like probably two years later after that they finally figured out, and the kid finally said, it's because I was removed from my home then. And then they understood. And then how do you approach that child? It's a bit different, right? It's a bit different. It's not the same kind of mentality again about the behavior. What's the meaning behind the behavior? What do they experience? How do we help you kind of move from that point? So it's really huge, and I think we need to really be documenting these, really having conversations, really if a child, okay, we know that trigger, we put a plan in place, but sometimes it doesn't work, right? So it doesn't work that Valentine's Day, so we go back and say, okay, well, why didn't it work? What could help the next time? What can we do? How do we document this so we know that I know, your teacher knows, your, mom, your caregiver now knows, whoever knows, right? And then really going back to it, or we debriefing and saying, you know, having that conversation and really focusing on not, you know, again, what was the feeling, what came up with that, and how do we approach that versus just a punishment kind of way of doing it, right? So what do we do when, I mean, again, not to, not to put it back on the word rule, but now a lot of teachers don't want to document stuff like that. They're like, you know, I just don't want to deal with it. So we're not in the classrooms every day. I have no, 10 yeah. schools. I yes. can't be in that one class yeah. with that one kid. So what do you suggest for these teachers on how to document? Like, because they're telling me there's no triggers. I'm like, there's always a trigger. There's always triggers. But they just don't want to document. They don't want to put the effort in. I'd almost approach it then. It's more, how do I help you to manage this child in the classroom? Mm -hmm. Right? You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. not even, like, if that's what it's about, I'd go where they're at and be like, so how do I make this easier for you in the classroom? We need to figure out these triggers so that that child is able to regulate in the classroom. You know what I mean? It's, it is about the child, of course, too, but how do you kind of work with them where they're at to kind of get them where they need to be, right? And saying, like, you know, spending, you know, however long on the triggers versus knowing the trigger, preventing it, not having that happen in the classroom is going to save way more amount of time than it is just coming up with a plan, right? So it is, I, I mean, I think it's difficult, but I think we have to advocate for that and advocate for you know the students that we work with and trying trying to do it and do the best that we can. At the end of the day, sometimes it's not going to look perfect either, but at least if we're trying to do it and do our best, we can tell the students that we did. So I mean, when we look at triggers. Really, again, the whole debriefing piece of it, um, which we just went through. Uh, the other thing I think that we don't kind of understand as well as we should, and I think everybody, is that, you know, we think, okay, we made this plan, and then the student, you know, in the moment gets upset and they don't use it. But when they're that upset and they're not regulated, they're not able to go to that plan, right? They're in this zone, they're in this zone where their brain is like not there, is not able to do that executive functioning, they're not able to problem solve, you know, so we're gonna have to, and which again takes time, we're gonna have to try to practice these with them when they're nice and calm, calm and collective, right? Yeah, and because, and I don't think, I think we think, oh, we did this plan and it didn't work and now, you know, the student didn't do it in the moment when they're really upset, but when we're, we're really upset, are we able to do everything that we say we put on paper? No. Right? So even for adults, even for us who are very professional, lovely people, we can't do it sometimes. Right? Poor EPA scrambling around with a behavior chart and stickers <laughs> and second things, and the kid's having a bigger meltdown, oh, you're not, yeah. Yeah, I've counted three times, you know, and it's like, no, oh, what are you? Specialist the conversation reminding me of what you said minutes yeah. ago about building that environment. And one of the slides that you kind of just yes. glossed over had wording on it. Yes. Uh, I couldn't see it. Okay, yeah. Enough, but no, yeah. sorry. but it, it, those are some of the, t and I speak as someone who was over 20 years in the classroom. Sometimes the environment can be changed so much by the wording that we as teachers use. And I was reminded of this when one of my students in grade five came back to talk to me as a 21 year old mm -hmm. and remembered that sorry, every, you know, he, he didn't come to school, as you said, intending to, to 
disrupt things. But it often happened, it often was in the first five minutes. Yeah. But he just told me at 24 years of age, he said, I knew that every day was going to be a, a fresh start with you. And I didn't even realize that. The fact that I, he, he pointed out to me that what he expected after an incident the previous day was that the next day would begin with, now, we don't want to have a repeat of yesterday. Let's make sure good. that you do yeah. this and this and this. He said, you just said, hey, how are you? I'm in the classroom. Yeah. And he said, it really made me feel that. This was him reflecting back when he was 11 years of age. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that, that when you reference that list that has the wording on it, I think sometimes those are little things that teachers may not be aware of that can have such huge impact. Oh, I'm sure. setting that day off. To That's the thing, checking in, checking in, beginning of the day, right? Just yeah. those moments. But how we check in. It's how we do it. Yeah, when we do for that sure. morning check in, yeah. it's to reiterate. Now remember, you did this yesterday, so don't do that again. Right. Yeah. And it brings it back to a negative place again, where most kids want to just say, yeah, I screwed up yesterday, just let me forget it and start fresh. Yeah. Anyway, I just share that as a yeah, no, yeah, no, it's great. Thank you. Or on another note, it's resolved by the end of the school day in the school environment because you know taking it home is going to rehash because it may not be effectively managed at home, mm -hmm. and and so you don't, you know, that's reassuring for the student because don't come home, you know, they have a meltdown as soon as they realize they've been disrupted, aren't regulating, and they're going to call home, and home doesn't manage it that well, right? It becomes even more punitive and more, you know, traumatic. And depending what precipitated the incident, mm -hmm. you can be working on self-regulation if the child is in the classroom and Call the parents and say, you know what, it started off, but he turned it around, it was great, reward them, thank you, just a little yeah. prompt. Because you know it, it's trouble at home. It didn't suck. Even though it was all hell all morning. <laughs> The other thing we know that children that have experienced trauma don't even know what they're feeling, right? So they don't know, they can't even name it sometimes, right? They can't name on the jigs yet. So it's even, what can we do or what can we suggest that happens in the classroom, even like, you know, some examples there, feeling charades, following leader games, looking at like for younger kids, even some for teenagers even like to do that. So whatever your group is, right, really looking at child-led activities, play, all those things that they can experience, again, in that safe environment that they may not have at home. What are people feeling, right? And we know these kids too are very much, um, they may interpret our expressions and emotions differently. So we, they'll be the first one to notice if you're slightly off, they're gonna notice it though, right? Because they may think like, okay, this person's gonna get angry at me, something's gonna happen, right? So there's varying kind of levels and degrees of kind of emotions there and what's appropriate and what they're exposed to and what they can read and what they can't. Sometimes they're hyper vigilant and kind of with their emotions, right? Um, big thing that we really promote is sensory modulation, mindfulness practices, and looking at how do you do that, right, within certain environments that I know it's harder in some than others, but we know these things work, like listening, playing to music, stress balls, mindfulness exercises, progressive muscle relaxation, um, sensory products like deep breathing, blowing bubbles, whatever it is for some of these kids, it's huge, I know, in some of our units. For a time there, it was bricking paper. I know that can be quite annoying, but that's what it did. If they want to brick paper, it works, whatever, right? Spikes in all the halls, right? Spikes in the learning centers. Oh, well, they're excellent, exactly. That's another slide. It's physical activity. If you can do that, if you can get up that energy, and that's the thing, they need to get it out sometimes, right? And we need to have those opportunities to do that. I was just thinking, well, I was looking at this list of things that it would be great for if, and this might be something to communicate back to the school in the moment where a teacher's losing it, like feeling their own regulation yeah. that messed with, yeah. it would be great to see the teachers saying to their principal, can you have someone step back for a minute? I need to model, like I need yeah. to do these things, which is modeling for the students. So it is. My teacher's regulating themselves, so, you know what I mean? It's, it's not true. just for the kids who no. are, yes. Yeah. Well, that's it, it's okay for mm -hmm. students to know, like, yes, I'm not, I'm have, like we're all gonna have it, it's just how do we deal with it? What do we do, right? And it's okay to have moments, but it's how do we, so when you spoke earlier about the kids diagnosed with ADHD that it's actually trauma, mm -hmm. sometimes yeah. these kids are being put on meds. Yeah. Who don't actually have ADHD? Right. Yeah. And they just, generally the meds don't work either. That's the other thing you'll see within classrooms. They'll be on the meds and the meds don't. 
So that's the thing. I mean, there's lots of different diagnoses and lots of different reasons. They could have depression, but it's really trauma. They could have anxiety, but it's trauma. You know what I mean? So it's really, again, kind of being curious about what's happening and really asking the questions and kind of seeing if there is that background to kind of have to know what people are assessed that they do this background so to keep that fun. I think like being preventative too, like I know there's a lot of triggers, some triggers you can see and sometimes yes. like in the school, you know, people come in and do presentations on things and it, it's to be mindful of, okay, what could be in that presentation oh, that could potentially yeah. be a trigger, not For only, sure. you know, like, yeah. so it's also to be mindful of that too yeah. within our schools, I think. Yeah. Especially That's when you're running programs. Program and some model program, self discovery, self empowerment girls group. You know, there's topics or sessions in that weekly session that could trigger. Yeah. You know. I'm just a, a little bit confused at something. So, if, sure. if someone is, if a child is diagnosed with anxiety, mm -hmm. but it's actually, but it's actually trauma, is the anxiety medication not really going to work? Well, it could, because I mean, they may have anxiety from their trauma, right? right? You know what I mean? So it, it depends on the kid, okay. right? So maybe, though, if we address the trauma, then the anxiety's going to go down. Do you know what I mean? Okay. So it depends on okay. the child, or maybe they need that medication in the interim until they deal with it. You know what I mean? So that would yeah, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Yeah, right. it is, and it may it may totally help them. Maybe what they need at that time to kind of get through it until yeah. they get to the point they're able to, to deal with it and cope with it. Have you ever thought about, or do you have it yet, have you seen, like, that, like fidget toys or like different things for staff when they're at meetings. You know how people might check out at meetings or they're, you know, in a space where they could be, um, yeah, thinking about stuff like or reminding themselves about certain practices. Like it's great when staff have a PD day and they have a presentation, but then it's gone because they're on. <coughs> so to have physical reminders around that this is the culture of the school. Like yeah, one thing that we're well, it's more kind of clients family related, but we're trying to get it more staff related too, is that we've invested in buying a lot of those kind of sensory items for either some of our areas that are more impatient of comfort rooms, but we also want to have comfort carts or comfort objects that anybody can use, right? So it's more like to be in the culture again, that it's kind of part of the culture that we all need to regulate, we all need to use these things again, the modeling thing, so a nurse on a floor, having a moment, then they need to do this too, right? So how do we provide those for everyone? So we're looking and we're not doing that yet, but we're looking at how do we do that. And sometimes in meetings, though, certain meetings, people will take in those items, or they'll take in coloring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, let's say, massage. <laughs> 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 we want to be going there. <laughs> so yeah, just even different things like that. Some people take in coloring or do coloring during, you know what I mean, meetings or different things. And, you know, they're still listening, still participating, still active. But yeah, but when we, kids do that, the class wrong. Teachers I teachers tell them we're not allowed to do it. So that's a thing, right? We're not it's, listening. Yeah. yeah. The kid who needs to stand up to write, no, you need to sit down. Yeah. Who cares if he's standing up? Yeah. He's not disrupting the class, he's just standing up. Yeah. So it is, it's how we think of things, right? And what our expectations are, and what collectively do we think is right and wrong. Or... So it's examining all those things and having these conversations about it. Um, so yeah, when we look at trauma informed schools, we're really looking at, you know, are we really aware about what trauma is? Do we see the connection with trauma and other symptoms that we just talked about? Um, are we promoting healing and again saying we know people can totally heal from trauma, can move on, lead productive lives. So we're really um, letting children know that too, that it's not just, you know, you're in the moment, it is difficult, but there is a silver lining and there is hope. Uh, how are we collaborating the systems again? Because I think we all need to do that better within our systems. We're kind of siloed working on our own things, but how do we again help one another, right, with both of our expertise to kind of do this. Uh, how are we looking at culturally competent practices? Because that definitely plays a huge role and definitely in a trauma informed way. Um, and do we have the tools to help kind of ourselves or the people that we work with to be more trauma informed? And they're looking at policies so discipline, absenteeism, all those kind of things. Like, how are we looking at those with a trauma informed lens? We're actually developing um, a trauma informed lens policy tool. So, once we get that, I will share it with you guys too because we're. There's a big ask for a lot of policies to come to the trauma informed care team to review them all the time. And then we're like, okay, it's great to review them, but we want to build capacity. So we're looking at developing a tool that will kind of look at what does this policy look like? How is it trauma informed? And kind of some questions to kind of guide that. And, so that's, and, that's where I'm, and that's where I'm kind of afraid of this new committee that the education department has put into play with, right, with the teachers that are gonna make changes within the classroom. 
that's what I'm kind of afraid that may happen there is that, you know, because, and, and we all say it, we'll, I'll be one of the first ones to say it, we need an attendance policy. Yeah. Because yeah. right now there's not. But yeah. it needs to be kids? done with a trauma informed sure, lens. Sure, exactly. That's the thing. It's not that we need these structures, but how do we do it in a trauma informed right. way? Yeah. I just want to jump in there with you raising that point. Uh, there is a public link to provide your feedback to the attendance policy, okay. and it's due back by May 9th. Okay. Just to put it like any individual out there can Sounds great. Yeah. respond to that. So I think your point is an extremely important one that needs to get it needs to get out there. That's the thing people need to be comfortable to even bring that up in a conversation, right? To kind of have a feedback. But it should be informing policy, yeah. not just action. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just to close, so the other piece of this is sustainability. So it's great for us to have this one-time education, all these kind of things happen, but how do we sustain it? So in our organization, we're really trying to build it into orientation. So everyone that comes into the health center gets trauma-informed care, kind of a 101 brief one, an orientation. Uh, we do another program-specific orientation, so mental health might look different than when it's newborn health. Uh, we try to build champions within an organization, so we have champions that are trained in delivering education sessions, so from admin assistants to physicians to all kind of across the board, different roles in the organization. Um, again, we talked about the policy piece, um, and really evaluating this, so again, we're doing our survey again in May to kind of see where we're at, and we're going to do it every year to kind of hopefully see some change in our practices and what we do. Um, looking at core competencies, checklists. And then the big thing that we're looking at, again, as a system-wide approach is, and we're just starting to do this, is do we embed kind of trauma-informed care questions when we hire people? Do we do it in performance evaluations? Do we really value this enough to really have it embedded in all those practices? So that's a piece that we're looking at now. Um, and a big one that's coming from a lot of uh, the universities is how do we embed this into our education? So when people come into the workforce, or they, are, they already know what trauma-informed care is, they already know what it is, they already know how to practice it, so it's not kind of us starting from square one when people under the workforce. So that's another piece that we're, we're looking at. Um, and then some just lessons learned along the way. Um, it's really, really important. Um, we were lucky to have buy-in from kind of our leadership, executive leadership, but it was also equally as important to have a frontline staff on board, and they actually were really, um, Great champions really bought into this early on, so it was really easy for us. They really, again, recognized themselves in it and said, we want to do this, we're fully there, so we've been really lucky with that. Um, balance and flow, um, maintaining, momentum, maintaining momentum and managing the floodgates. Um, because when this got out, there was lots of requests, oh, can we look at this policy, can we look at this? So again, in your own kind of areas and schools and groups that you guys work in, really looking at how do you manage that once people do buy in. You know, what can you guys do, what resources do you have to do that? And with us, we were lucky because it did come out of recommendations for us in our health center that we do have some time allotment of my role and some others point people um, and money to do that because it does take, it's not that you can't do it without that, it'll just take you a little bit longer. Right? Um, role modeling. So I think that's the biggest thing. Um, and even self-reflection for myself, it's really, if I'm out there talking about trauma-informed care, how am I being safe, how am I being trustworthy, how am I really modeling that in my interactions with people? Because I can't be out there saying, oh, do trauma-informed care, and I'm like, not that way at all. So it's really reflecting on kind of how can I model those principles. And even under um, frontline staff and leadership, they're really looking at how can they do that themselves too. Um, and addressing assumptions. So you'll have a lot of people within your areas that kind of say, oh, I already know trauma-informed care is, I do that all the time. And we had a lot of people that said that, that was the truth. <laughs> there are some people that totally did and were on board and did it all the time, but a lot of people have misconceptions about what it means, so having those conversations with your colleagues about what does it really mean in practice, on a practical level. But how do you, how do you address problem? that, though, when they think they're trauma-informed and they're really not? Well, I mean, it just, it's in the moment, almost. It's in the moment teaching, like, oh, have you ever think about that, or I heard that yeah. in a session, or whatever. Well, I made a comment one day. Yeah. I turned to the principal and I said, that was really trauma-informed. And I turned one away, and I left her with that one because it was like horrendous. And I know that's not nice, but I like, <laughs> oh, you know, I was like, wits end at that point. Yeah. And that's the thing, like, how do we? And that's, it's, it's,
there been many a time where you have to, you know, just bite my tongue, whatever, but it is, it's how do I reach that, how do I reach that person in a way that's going to get them? For somebody, it may be because this is going to improve better, uh, less sick time for staff, or this is going to do this, or this is going to be better patient outcomes, or that there's going to be different kind of niches for different people, and I need to find out what is their reason for wanting to do this, and how do I reach that in a way that kind and of... And I think when we're dealing them. with kids, too, we need to come to the conclusion that we may not get to the bottom part of what that trauma is. No, we may not. Because it could be, you know, familial, it's so buried, and so hidden, and we don't talk about it, and you don't bring it up, you know, so yeah. we may need to learn how to control it rather than cure it. Yeah, and it's, it's almost to speak. The basic thing, which is huge, if you create a safe environment for that child or youth, and they feel safe coming to you even about other things, nothing to do with trauma, that may be like the best thing you ever do for them in their life, right? Yeah. That's kind of, so. You might not hear about it for 21 years. That's right, right. exactly. Right. You may not hear about it for 21 years, but that's the thing that if people, people feel that, that's the basis, right? If you feel safe, if you don't feel safe, nothing else is gonna happen, but if you do feel safe, then it creates that foundation for learning and for growth, right? So. And just on the staff end, uh, we also learned, and this will be the last point, if you ask people about compassion, fatigue, and vicarious trauma, then you need to respond because when we did these sessions, we had a lot of people um, have aha moments and say, I am burnt out to have experienced compassion, fatigue, and then what do we do as organizations to support that? So what resources do we have to say, like, okay, you've experienced it, so now what can we do to help you? So uh, we're really conscious about that and really working on that. So these are lots of training modules for you guys to take a look at. They're not too long, but they're really good. Um, there's different resource guides, there are websites, and that's my contact information. And really, if you ever want, you know, you have a question or want to partner on anything, please let me know. Feel free to call me and email, and I'd be very happy to partner with you. So thank you. Thank you.